Hi everyone, this is Jan Kabili for The Fix, the podcast that's all about Lightroom, Photoshop, and post-processing. You may have heard that Adobe has released a brand new version of Lightroom, Lightroom CC and Lightroom 6. It's the same program, it just has a different name depending on how you access it, either by downloading Lightroom CC from Creative Cloud or by purchasing a perpetual version of Lightroom known as Lightroom 6. In this episode of The Fix, I'm sitting down with one of the great experts in Lightroom, Peter Crow. Peter and I are going to talk about some of the new features in Lightroom CC, Lightroom 6, including the really exciting face recognition feature and how to make a raw panorama right in Lightroom. Now, we don't have time to cover all the new features, so if you'd like to see more, I hope you'll visit the webinar that I'm posting to thisweekinphoto.com in the webinars section, where I'm going to go into lots more detail about many of the new features in this really exciting program. So let's talk to Peter Crow about a couple of those new features. Hey, Jen. Uh, great to be here with you. Well, I'm so great uh, grateful that you're doing this with me because you um, really know Lightroom and you know what's going on with the new features in Lightroom, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm always excited when they bring a new version out. They've um, there's always a lot of hard work that goes into making useful stuff, and once again, I think they've they've uh, done a good job getting some things that I'm going to use all the time. And uh, we'll we'll talk about panos, which is uh, what I'm I'm really excited about. Um, and then there's there's a bunch of other stuff that's that's uh, delivering here as well. Um, some of it fully ready for prime time, and some of it uh, like all of Lightroom, uh, part of continuous improvement. That's right. <laughs> well, we do have a number of very exciting new features. Um, we, as Peter mentioned, uh, there is a new way to make panoramas directly in Lightroom without having to go to Photoshop. Same thing goes for HDR or high dynamic range images. You can make them right in uh, Lightroom now without going to Photoshop, and there are advantages of that process. Um, Peter will show you some of the advantages of making panos here. And there also is a great new feature that you may not even have thought about for Lightroom, but that is very exciting, and that is face recognition leading to automatic face tagging. And we're going to talk a little about that, too. And there also are some smaller features, um, some things under the hood, like an enhanced um, GPU capability that makes working in the, in the develop module smoother. There is a filter brush in the uh, radial filter and in the... Um, graduated filter tool that will help you to make to use those filters in ways that go beyond just making linear adjustments with a graduated filter or oval adjustments with the radio filter and lots more. So let's start talking about some of those features. How about face recognition? Peter, can you tell us what it does, what it is, a little bit about how it works? Sure. Well, you know, this is uh, as my as I understand it, the most requested feature for Lightroom. Uh, over time, and the, it's been in uh, a number of other products, and you know people are quite used to it with uh, with Facebook and other places they use their pictures, and and so it was clearly a thing that Adobe needed to do to get rolling here in Lightroom, and essentially what you what it is is an engine that can go through and find different people. It can it can find faces and it it uh, tags a region as having a face in it, and then it can actually find other uh, instances of that same person, which, um, when it works, is absolutely magic, and can really help you uh, you know sort out a big collection of photos. And the ultimate result of this is that you get tags in your keyword tag panel. Um, for the people that the system recognizes, right? Yeah, so uh, obviously it doesn't know who anybody is. Um, you have to tell it by typing in that, you know, this is Josie or this is Maddie or this is Allison. And uh, once you start applying that name to the face region, it will go through and find other instances of the same person uh, or people it thinks are the same person and ask you to confirm uh, or deny and uh, over time as you confirm and and also reject um, 
the system itself learns and it can begin to recognize people even better. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really impressed with is that I have two daughters who, um, at times when I look back at older pictures, I, it can take me a minute or two to, uh, to know which is which. Um, hopefully they aren't watching this. And, uh, um, <laughs> Having the, the it's the Lightroom's face recognition has been remarkably good at knowing which is Josie and which is Maddie, and that's and that's pretty great. I've you know really only started working through the vast backlog of images to see um, how well it's going to do, but well, so, when it works, it's so let's be clear so people understand the way that you start using this is that you have to have Lightroom index or analyze all the photos in. A selected source and by default that source is your entire catalog now you can tell it hey I don't want you to go through my entire catalog I got way too many pictures and right now I don't have time for that so you can limit the indexing to just a folder or just a collection that you select is that right right you can you can tell it globally to, to index or not and you can turn the thing on and off um, my suspicion is that over time they're going to tune the ability for users to to turn it on and turn it off for specific uh, collections of images. It's um, you know it would it would be uh, normal for people to you know if you have big crowd shots or something like that and you just don't know the names of people that it can get to be kind of a pain um, to if it keeps finding faces and you obviously have no idea who they are. It's a great tool for um, you know family vacation or you know big family reunion or something like that where you have a lot of the same faces reappearing um, and uh, uh, so but but really at the heart of it it's about learning who the people are and then applying those as what are essentially keywords to the images it shows up in the keywords panel as though it was a, a keyword although it's a little bit different it's a people keyword um, so it's it's supposed to be used only for faces. Right. And so, you know, I'm always trying to break things down and try to make them in these little systems. And so I see it as having three components. First, the analyzing of the images that you tell it to analyze, looking for things that appear to be faces as opposed to, you know, balls or dog toys or right. books, right? And that's the first part. And then the second part is you, the user, going into the people view, which is a new view in addition to grid view and loop view um, that you normally have in the library module. This is a, not in the library, is it in the library module? Yeah. Yeah, yes. and the people view is a whole separate view, and you go in there, and there you start teaching Lightroom who is who of the people, of, of from among the photos it has identified as having some, somebody's faces in them. You start naming those faces, and then Lightroom starts to learn from that so that it can start to guess who is who, and you have less um, manual naming of faces. So that's part two, right? Yes. And then part three is all over in the keyword panel where you get the result of that, which is these automatically made people keywords, which, as Peter is saying, are more than just plain old keywords. They are part of this whole system of face recognition. Yeah, and, and for those who were who are geeky under the hood types, um, the, the system that Lightroom is using to draw the box where the face is and make the notation that this is a picture of Allison um, is, is being done in a way that's compatible with many of the larger systems that are out there. So my Sony camera can recognize a face when I shoot a picture and that box that the camera um, is drawing ultimately uh, while while it doesn't really sync up right now with Lightroom ultimately we'll see all of that stuff grow together and um, and the same thing with what Facebook is doing you know it's it's a lot easier for Facebook to do this because you know Facebook only is going to try and tag people that are your friends so you know if you have 200 friends on Facebook, it's only having to ever look for 200 people in pictures. And it also may know that, you know, your friend was at this event. So it's a lot easier for Facebook to do it than Lightroom, which is 
sort of doing it by by pure computer vision and horsepower. Um, again, I think it it should all be understood within the context of a new feature that will definitely get better, just like everything in Lightroom has gotten better version to version. Well, I like what you're saying, that the way that Adobe has done it, uh, the smart way, <laughs> is so that eventually it will be able to maybe link up with other systems as well. But right now, it's just contained within Lightroom, to be clear. Um, yeah, it actually, it, it writes it out to an exported file in a way that's compatible with these other systems, but right now all the other systems are not talking to each other very well yet. But there is a there is a uh, a common language they're supposed to speak, and and Lightroom is in fact speaking that language. Okay, so explain that when you export, what options do you have regarding um, these people keywords? You uh, have a privacy option in there to uh, suppress the. Um, the data where you can remove the person info and uh, by default that's checked and and that um, is a privacy issue uh, just like the location info by default um, location information is removed on export um, but essentially what what happens is that it writes the the people keywords as person shown, which is a, a type of metadata that's supposed to indicate the name of a person in a picture. And, and so that is a broadly compatible way to say this is a, you know, a picture of this person. In the same way that you could, you know, a picture of the White House might have the keyword Barack Obama, but um, it's not a picture of him. Whereas this person shown metadata is supposed to say this person's actually in the picture. It's not just a picture that's sort of about that person in general, but it actually is a, a picture of that person. It's, it's, a, it's a fine distinction, but a, an important one, ultimately. It is. But again, I think, as you pointed out, the way that I think that a lot of people are going to use this at first is sort of on a consumer level, that this is a great way just to keep track of all the pictures of your daughter over the years, yeah. um, you know, as opposed to uh, really getting down and, and looking at the underlying um, kind of data that Lightroom is exporting about the person keywords. Yeah. It's interesting, though. Yeah, there's like me and six other people who are in. Right. <laughs> the geek -geek -geeks. <laughs> okay, now question for you. Yeah. And I know you know the answer, but I don't mean to put you on the spot if you don't. It's okay to say you don't. What happens if, like, I've been really pretty good about keeping track of the people in my photos over the years. Yeah. And I've made my own um, keyword that says people or persons or something. And then in that, ca I made that a category by shoving other keywords inside of it for my daughter and my son and everybody that I keep taking pictures of. Now, what happens with all those keywords that I made? Can I turn those into people keywords that work in this system? Yeah, so unfortunately there's no um, no easy way to force change all of those into faces. You know, if, if you have all these pictures of Josie, there's no way to say, look through all of these pictures and tag Josie's face in all of these. So um, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not perfect yet. And for those who have massive, you know, who, for the, you know, 1% or one half of 1% of people in the world who've uh, thoroughly keyworded their collections with every person's name, this is, you know, not the tool that's going to be adding something to them, for them. But I think what you can do, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think so, you can select regular keywords like you know, Peter is in my yeah. keyword list, and then right-click that keyword and say convert keyword to person keyword. And I could do this selecting multiple keywords at once and do that. And what that will do is put that keyword in the system so that it will help, uh, you know, so that Peter will be a name that Lightroom knows and will be perhaps look for next time. Right, becomes a person keyword. Um, it doesn't directly tell Lightroom to draw the face box and uh, I think that should segue into an example of a place where they have done an awesome job of showing how multiple um, iterations and continuous innovation has created this incredible capability now to save your, D your panorama or your HDR as a DNG. Terrific. And 
and this is you know this this I think should should help people understand that the whole the whole development process here is a process and what we see today is going to be you know much much better in the future so so to uh, to launch straight into that the thing that that I'm most excited about here in Lightroom 6 uh, or Lightroom CC is the ability to make a raw stitched panorama from multiple images and to have the the image data still be raw so that I can have the full capability of um, tonal and color corrections that I would have to the original but have it in the stitched version of the picture which is is a real uh, real amazing capability on one hand but also a real um, uh, aid to my workflow and a way to streamline workflow. So will you show us that? Will you share your, your screen and show us? Sure. So while Peter is sharing his screen, just to for people who may not remember, up until now you could select uh, a photos that you shot as a panorama, individual photos in Lightroom, but to stitch them together you had to move them from Lightroom to Photoshop and the work was done in Photoshop and then you would save in Photoshop and the result would come back to Lightroom if you did it right, <laughs> but not as a raw file, as either a TIFF or a PSD, a non-raw version file. So they might look great but they wouldn't have the, the breadth of data in them and all the other advantages that you get with RAW that you now get when you use the process Peter's about to show you. Yeah, so I'm going to start the process here and and then I'm going to actually explain a little bit about what you just said while we wait for this to chug through the images. So what we're seeing here are 10 images and they were shot as I was spinning around in a circle and you, you can see there's some overlap. You can also see if, if you look at the horizon, I wasn't doing this particularly carefully. I believe I had had um, a fruity beverage at that point and was maybe not holding things as straight as I could but but I've tagged these with a um, with a label that I've set up uh, that uh, the green I have the green label set up to mean panorama and you can see uh, that um, that that's one of my labels here and so anyway uh, that just helps me find the panoramas and I'm gonna grab those and then I'm gonna go down to this new thing uh, photo merge and these are both working inside Lightroom instead of the old edit in which took you over to Photoshop and then I'm gonna hit panorama and at this point I'm just gonna have it set on auto and it's gonna uh, look through the images and see if it can detect an overlap and create a panorama um, and show it to me. I just I have to ask you something which is some people can't see they can only hear because they're listening to the audio so could you be a little clearer about after you went to the photo menu in the library module and you chose photo merge pano yeah. then a window opened called the panorama merge preview window and that is where you're talking about something auto. Yes that's correct. So we have basically um, a couple of options. Uh, the top option, uh, auto select projection. Um, and basically, this is which um, these three options, spherical, cylindrical, perspective, are the mathematical models that Lightroom uses to uh, stitch the images together. And um, broadly stated, um, spherical is for uh, panos where you have a very wide angle lens, a very wide angle from top to bottom. Um, cylindrical is more like if you think about just panning your camera across the horizon. Um, and then perspective is if, you're sh if you have a picture of buildings and you want the building um, to all the lines on the building to remain straight. And uh, auto is going to use the one it thinks is best and you can you know look through these and see what the different versions will do in this case because it's so wide um, when I hit perspective it tells me that it, it can't even do it so um, spherical uh, tends to um, to 
to show it in a more sort of scrunched top to bottom cylindrical pulls it upwards and or you could just hit auto and um, it's going to give you a preview and as you go through those three buttons you can see the different previews. Now right there is a huge advantage because if I remember correctly when you did this in Photoshop, um, you don't get the preview. You have to actually go ahead and wait and do your whole, go through the whole procedure to see the result. Here in Lightroom, you can preview the various um, different methods of projection before you merge the, before you stitch the panel. Correct? Yeah, and I would say that you know what what they've done here is a is a pretty good implementation. Again, I think they're going to get better and better at it. Um, it's you know it's not as great as some of the, the you know really the expensive and or the very dedicated panorama tools but in my testing it's done a pretty good job for the stuff that I've got uh, many of which are handheld and a little bit sloppy and it does a pretty good job merging them but in in any case the merge that it's doing is uh, is saving the raw data so that I still have this huge ability to make it look the way I want in the end. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit the merge button. Wait, wait, just wait, wait, before you do that, okay. what about that okay. thing that says auto-cropped? Do you ever use uh, auto-crop? I don't. You know, I tend to actually like the the rough edges here, um, at least in my, in my proof stitching. Um, I may go in and crop it later, but what a, what auto crop does basically is it gets rid of all that all that white junk on the edges. Um, so when you when you uh, for those who are just listening, when you have a pano stitch, it doesn't make an exact rectangle. There's always some some um, kind of rounded edges somewhere, usually along the top and bottom, and then often on the right and left. And auto crop just gets rid of that, so it looks like a you know a clean framed photograph. Um, at this part of the process, I typically want to see that stuff because maybe I'll use Content Aware Fill to fill out the corners, um, or maybe I will be stretching this in um, in the lens correction, either do some vertical correction or or rotate, and so I just want to have that full image. In the in the stitch that I'm making right now. Great answer, yes. But the nice thing again is you can check and uncheck auto crop in this preview without hurting anything. And it, in just a second, it gives you a preview. You can see how it would look if you did crop away the edges. You know, yes. it's just, it just helps you to see if it's a good if you want to continue or not. Yep. So, yeah. Great. Uh, okay, so I'm going to hit merge, and it's going to take a, a minute to do this. Uh, if you have real high res images you know if I was doing this with my D800 files and it was you know 15 of them it could take a long time to run but I want to talk about uh, briefly one of the real advantages here um, especially for people who do handheld panos like I do one of the things that's really important is to kind of proof the stitching before you decide whether you want to make it perfect and and in the the olden days, that would be the days um, in uh, say last month and earlier, <laughs> um, you had two choices. You either had to do a kind of a low res stitch in in Photoshop and see whether you liked it, and then come back and work on the picture, or you you know you would make it perfect and high res and then stitch it and then maybe if you stitch you when, once you stitched it you might say I don't really like it all that much um, so this and this DNG raw stitching gives us the ability to stitch uh, what I like to say stitch first ask questions later um, so I can make the the merged pano and I can look at it and decide how much I like it, and given how much I like it, then I can decide how much work I want to put into it. And what might, so you mentioned at this point, um, let's say I do like it, but, yeah. um, uh, and there's really, uh, you know, what, what might you do at this point? Might you go through the basic panel in Lightroom with it, or would you just take it to Photoshop and cut away the edges? What would you, what's a normal work? So, uh, for me, almost certainly this would, would, um, 
uh, take some work in at least the basic panel and um, you know probably also the uh, HSL panel but you know what I would I'm um, I'm seeing the the highlights are a little blown out there so I'm gonna open in the shadows a little bit but then close down the um, the exposure a bit and I can zoom in and look at it and and if I want to change the white balance I can do that maybe tune the white balance a little bit I could also put a you know graduated filter on it if I want and maybe darken the sky down a hair and it seems like the beauty is that because it is this pano is a raw file you have all the advantages you have with every raw file in terms of lots of uh, leeway to adjust um, the ability to treat white balance as if it's from scratch the ability to change the cal camera calibration profile or any of that is that right yeah and you know panoramas are a thing that you know are kind of photography that very frequently you have pretty different lighting in different parts of the photograph so having the full um, tonal and color data that you have in your raw file in the stitched pano gives you the ability to go and and make that look as good as it possibly could and you can do it once you've done the stitch and decide whether you like the picture or not and um, you know it's it's very common in a you know if you're doing a 180 degree panorama to have something that's kind of backlit on one side and then something that you know where you're uh, where the the thing is front lit you know and you may have two some very different lighting across the whole picture and given it's great to have that ability to to have the full raw adjustment anywhere in the picture yeah it is that's what I'm really excited about I think that's great so between that fact and the fact you get to preview it terrific I'm very happy this is happening and but still you might go to Photoshop at this point to get rid of all that white stuff around the edges perhaps with content to wear fill or if you didn't want to you could just crop it away in Lightroom yeah I would typically you know on something like this I might might work on the on it with the uh, lens corrections so mm -hmm. if I want to if I want to say look at that building a little bit maybe try and give it a little a little more uprightness and and let's rotate it a bit to get the horizon line a little more um, the way I want it to be and maybe even some play with the oh, yeah. uh, barrel distortion and so I can I can do a fair amount of work to this and and at this point now I can do the cropping so so I can do the cropping here and then we also have this weird flare that's shown up oh, yeah I and thought those were seagulls <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it was lens flare. I was shooting into the sun there. That's and that's actually uh, two different bits of lens flare, and we can just take the, uh, um, the spot removal tool, spot tool, yeah. and and out they come. If you want, if you want them to be gone, the second one wasn't all that good. But uh, anyway, so so all of this work can be done um, all to that raw data, which I think is just great. Yeah. And and the other thing that's really nice about it, if you're somebody like me who will go out and shoot a whole ton of panoramas at once, is that there's a, a headless mode that lets you choose images and say go stitch all of these, um, you know, stitch all of these images without even going through the dialog, and and you can say just go stitch a whole bunch of them in auto and. And why would you do that? Just so you can get a sense of how they would be if you. Yeah, wanted. and see whether you, see whether you like them. So uh, you know, select the images, and then um, Control Shift M, and you can see up here that it's creating the panorama now. Um, and so I could run through and just do a whole bunch of them like that. So select that that image and then let's go select the next image control shift M and basically stack up these operations go get a cup of coffee and come back and then I'll have all my uh, panos stitched and I can decide which ones I really want to do some work to um, and uh, uh oh <laughs> so, uh, 
uh, so this this happens occasionally. Is that it? The pano f uh, fails to merge, and uh, the error message we're getting here is that it it wasn't able to create a merge, um, and that that's a particularly uh, that's a real hazard of shooting handheld panoramas, but um, uh, and and in that case, maybe you have to go to Photoshop to do the merge. Well, now at least you know. You know, you wouldn't waste time on that. Like, yeah. go <laughs> go to another. Yeah. Great. Well, that's terrific, Peter. Thank you so much for showing us that. And you know, that's just one of the new exciting features in Lightroom CC, Lightroom Six. Yes. Um, and I do want to say, I, I wish we had more time, and I would ask you to show us more, but I think that's all the time we have uh, for this broadcast. Okay. But, but I do want to um, <clears throat> tell people, just in case they're confused about why I keep saying Lightroom CC, Lightroom 6, uh, they are the same, but it just depends how you buy the program. So if you are a Creative Cloud subscriber and you get Lightroom that way, then you will have a version that's named Lightroom CC, but if you buy the perpetual version of Lightroom, which you still can do, where you actually buy the license, you're not subscribing to anything, then it's called Lightroom 6. Yeah, and with the exception of the um, the capability to integrate it with your mobile device, they're essentially the same. Um, that's right, so only the Creative Cloud subscribers get to do the syncing with Lightroom Mobile, right? We will have to do a show at some point on Lightroom Mobile because I'm very excited about it. I I love using it, and my my wife, uh, who is a, you know the fa a family photographer, she loves it as well. And um, and I think that's a a really great addition that they're that they've made to the Lightroom family. But that's a whole other program. Yes, it is. And we will yeah. probably bring you that one too. If I yeah. can corral Peter again. Peter, I always love having you on the show. You're so smart. You know what's going on and you're a great explainer. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm uh, happy to come back anytime. All right, great. And for all you out there, um, if you're wondering about other features in Lightroom CC, Lightroom 6, I am, um, I'll be broadcasting a webinar on the topic where I'll be going through all the major features in the new program, um, and I'll be showing you exactly how they work. So I hope that you'll look for that on thisweekinphoto.com in the webinars section. But that's all we have time for tonight, so thank you all for joining us.